So I promise I won't make this talk too long. The sun is shining and there's a lot of cool things to learn outside. So I'll try to keep this in about half an hour to 40 minutes. Um, so I've never given a talk quite like this. Usually it's a talk about a research project. We go through the usual intro, methods, results, discussion, and questions. So, um, and I usually start with an outline, but that doesn't quite work here. So I have a slightly different outline. I'm going to give you more of a, the timeline, how I've moved around for the last ooh, 12 years. So we're way up here. Yeah. <laughs> Ecuador is way down here on the equator line. Um, we're not very creative, so we named it Ecuador. So anyway. <laughs> Um, and that's where my journey started. I, was, I did an undergraduate in uh, biology at the University of Guayaquil. Um, and from there, I moved to the University of Oregon. I was a, um, a Fulbright scholar, and I did a master's at the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology, where I met my um, PhD major advisor, Dr. Jessica Miller, who had just gotten a job here at the Hatfield Marine Science Center. So I found during a, my master's, I found that juvenile Chinook salmon were using sandy beach surf zones. So the ocean beaches where um, your kids may play, waist deep, that's where the juvenile salmon were um, inhabiting. And she thought that was really cool and suggested I should do it for my PhD program. So about five years later, I had a PhD and then moved to Michigan. So it's quite a long trip, as you can tell. Um, yeah. So I moved to Mount Pleasant in central Michigan, um, where I did a postdoc. Thanks to a, another fellowship, I then moved back to Guayaquil, to the Escuela Superior Politécnica del Litoral. Um, for a year, um, it was supposed to be a two to three year fellowship. Um, oil revenue went down, fellowship went bye bye. So while I was there, I met Palayo Salinas, which is a researcher at the Charles Darwin Foundation. And he said, hey, I got an idea. I need a fisheries ecologist. Why don't you move out to the island? And so I said, let me think about that as I finish packing my bags. <laughs> and then a month later, I was um, on the island. And I've been there ever since. Okay. So as you know, the Charles Darwin Foundation was named after one of the most commonly known or popular visitors. Charles Darwin, who visited in 1835 on the Beagle. Um, and as you can see, he took quite a tour around the islands. He didn't land on many, like he landed on San Cristobal. This is Santa Cruz Island, um, and Puerto Llora is right there. That's where I live. He didn't land on Santa Cruz, but he took quite the tour. Um, and in, because of a lot of the information that we got from him, um, the Charles Darwin Foundation was declared under Belgian law in the late 1950s. This was a, an effort between the Belgian government, the Ecuadorian government, the UNESCO, and the UN. This is a picture of one of the first buildings. Um, this, if you've ever been to the Galapagos, this uh, is at the entrance of our foundation. Um, a, not sure why the picture of the iguanas, but they're really cool. Um, and a picture taken of the people that signed the agreement. Most of the research and the work that was done at that point in time was uh, captive breeding programs. The most successful one was the tortoise. So many of the, of the species that were living on the islands were um, fairly low in population numbers. Uh, we had pirates, um, fishermen, we had um, wild dogs, we had goats and, um, and pigs that would eat their food or trample on their nests. So, they were doing pretty poorly. And so one of the first uh, programs was to bring back these populations. This program was a success, and then it was passed on to the national park, the Galapagos National Park. We also worked with um, terrestrial iguanas, which um, we had similar success. Right now, we're looking into the pink iguana, which is a fairly new species. Well, it's not new. It's fairly newly described. Um, that lives on Isabella. And there's about 300 to 400 individuals total. Um, and it's just, we had never noticed the pink iguana. Um, we're not sure how that happened, but they live very close to active volcanoes, so it's not the easiest 
way to survive, basically. So we're hoping to um, similarly do a program with them. But a lot of that was terrestrial work. So in 1998, the uh, Marine Reserve was declared. It's about 133,000 square kilometers. And basically, it's, it's an imaginary line around the external islands 40 nautical miles out. So it's 133,000 kilometers. And what's quite unique is if you look at the islands, the green areas are all park. So as you can see, most of the province of Galapagos is a park. If you look at the pink, those are the towns. So there's a town on Santa Cruz, like I mentioned, Isabela, this is where the penguins are, um, Puerto Vaquerizo Moreno, which is on San Cristobal, this is the capital, and then Floriana, that's it. Those are the only towns. And the little orange spots are agricultural land. The rest is protected area, which is amazing. And that is largely because of these amazing animals, marine iguanas, the only penguin on the tropics, and the flightless cormorants that inhabit these islands. So this video was not working earlier, so we had the thought of just switching it over to another slide. For some reason, it plays better. So um, the director of the, um, the foundation and several other people in the communications department put together a video for you guys. In case you had, let's see if it plays. Ooh, that's not the video. Conducting scientific research and conservation while being entirely financed by donations. Our mission is to generate knowledge, to provide technical assistance to the government of Ecuador in order to preserve and conserve this vital ecosystem for the future generations. <laughs>
different. Okay, so why are the Galapagos so unique? So the Galapagos, like I mentioned, are in the tropics and they're located in a place where there are different currents, ocean currents. We have this equatorial undercurrent, so it's about 200 meters deep in the water. Um, coming from the west, there's a south equatorial current that comes in from the, w from the east. Um, and then you have the Panama current coming from the north and the um, Peru current. This undercurrent crashes against the, the islands and then comes up. So there's upwelling. There, it's very cold, nutrient-rich water, very similar to what you have here, except you have wind-driven um, upwelling. We have this topo topo topography-based current um, upwelling. Excuse me. And so this cold, very nutrient-rich water basically mixes throughout the archipelago. Um, and what happens is that that produces a lot of primary production. So this is chlorophyll, um, which is a measurement of phytoplankton. So the very basis of, of the, of the um, food chain. And all that mixing allows for different ecoregions throughout the archipelago. So you have the far northern islands up here. So basically two small rocks um, where the largest biomass of sharks in the world occur. Um, you have the western um, part of the archipelago where you have this very cold, nutrient-rich water. Um, this is where a lot of the sea cucumber fishery occurred, if you've ever read about that. And you have the central southeastern islands, which have a mixture of panamic, Peruvian, and tropical um, um, species. And this allows for unique and very diverse biological communities. Um, but this, um, and I have a few more videos for you. So this is off of Darwin and Volpe. This is in a place they call the amphitheater. So it's right behind um, Darwin's arch. Um, they call it that because divers, you go down about 75 feet onto a platform, and you just sit there, and you watch this. So hundreds of hammerhead sharks swimming above you. They just don't notice you. Most of them are large females. We think they're mostly. Um, pregnant, um, and it's not completely sure why, but this is the one of the most popular spots on the archipelago. We just came back from here, so I, I just had to show you that video. Um, my work takes me often to the mangrove areas, so mangroves make up about 24% of the coast. It's not really what the, um, um, the art islands are known for, mostly the rocky subtitle is what we think of them, but there's a lot of mangroves, and there's these pots or holes that they call them. Um, and you see quite interesting communities like sea lions. Um, these folks are quite playful and quite curious, and they'll steal your fins if you're not careful. And What's always interesting to me is that, so we also have a lot of sea turtles. Green sea turtles will nest on many of the islands, um, which are, um, what, what, but what's interesting to me is that even though these are mangrove areas, which we think of very turbid environments, you can see the um, visibility is quite good. So we were several meters away from this sea turtle, and yet the video is amazing. The reason I was there was to look at fishery species. So these are all snapper, dog snapper is what they call them. Um, and these are all mangrove roots. So you can see this is about three feet deep. And we were actually just snorkeling there. But um, you can see the amount of biomass that we found in these um, mangrove areas. And I was actually not studying any of these folks, but they were more curious about me than um, then I was looking for one particular fish. There he is. It's a yellowtail snapper. This is like finding Waldo almost. There he is again. Um, and so they're all snappers, but that guy is a, is a different species. It's a heavily fished, um, and so we're trying to get a little bit more about uh, information about them. They, their juvenile um, use mangrove areas, and as they get bigger, they move out into the rocky subtitle. So this was a great place to study their, um, their juvenile. On the way back from that trip, we were on the little um, panga, going back to the, the bigger sort of mothership. 
And this was my first time on the island. Um, I, I had just been there for a month or so. And we run into these folks. And it was pretty funny because the guy that I was with, my uh, colleague, was like, would you, you know, if you'd like, we can get in. And he was saying that, not looking at me, while I was already in the water and basically just had to rush to, to chase me. And so we took this awesome video of bottlenose dolphin. Um, and there were just hundreds of them. We couldn't get a good shot, but there were also a couple of sharks on the bottom. They were just hanging out. Apparently, there are several populations that might be resident. Um, and so it's, it's quite an amazing place. But that kind of, that kind of uh, biology and endemic species attracts quite a lot of challenges. So um, one of them is, of course, us, people. So here we have uh, the number of, so here's year on your x-axis, and we have the number of residents on the y-axis and visitors on this other y-axis. This one is the visitors on the green line, and the blue are the residents. And what you can see is that you have an almost exponential increase in both people that want to live there and want to come visit. At present, we're at about 25,000 people on the island and about 225,000 visitors every year. And that is largely driven by the number of people that want to get in the water. So here's the X, uh, year on the x-axis again and number of people on the y. Um, the blue line are the number of people that are diving or snorkeling. You can see that, again, it's increasing quite a lot. Um, as uh, more diving opportunities, you can rent diving gear, snorkeling gear. So it's, um, you can go on one-day trips and um, just go visit amazing places. So it gets cheaper and it gets more easy for people to get out there. But of course, this has very strong and indirect impact. So this is the number of invasive species. As you can see, again, exponential growth on the number that are coming in. Um, obviously not on purpose, but it is an indirect impact. And this is, as many of you know, very expensive to manage. And think about that in a developing country, and on top of that, on some oceanic islands that are a thousand uh, kilometers offshore. So it's quite an, a challenge. The other thing that has increased dramatically is the number of fishermen on the islands. So this is a plot, again, year on the x-axis here, and the number of fishers on the y-axis. As you can see, it increased dramatically up until about 2002. That was the top of the um, sea cucumber fishery. And this increased despite the fact that um, in 1998, the special law for Galapagos was um, declared. That's when the marine reserve was uh, declared. What did happen was that we switched from a mostly commercial fishery to an artisanal fishery. So very small boats, about 10 uh, yards in length. Um, but a lot of the same problems still persist. We still have problems like finning of sharks, for example. Even though the whole reserve is protected, we still, and, but the fact that there's such a large biomass of sharks still attracts problems like that. So that's what um, fisheries ecologists come in. Um, and fisheries ecologists, so the next few slides are very simple cartoonish, and I apologize, um, but they seem to work quite well with a very diverse um, audience, such as yourself. And so fisheries biologist is a little simpler. Usually it's not, it's not simple work, but it's simpler to explain. It's usually getting a number of fish that the fishery can take, for example. Um, in the case of fisheries ecologists, it's a little different. So take, for example, if you have a certain number of fish. If you eat both, you have very sad people afterwards, right? You have no more fish to eat afterwards, either for the people to eat or the fisheries to take. So an option would be to eat only part of that, but what if you have mortality through other sources? So natural mortality, for example, sharks, as happens in the Galapagos. Again, the same conclusion, right? We have very sad people. So the other option is, if you know a little bit about this natural mortality, you know a little bit about the uh, reproductive biology, so how many babies these fish can have, and how much or how far they can disperse or move away from um, each other, and then how much those grow, we can now eat certain parts and still have enough for the next day to fish or to eat. So 
in summary, what we try to do as fisheries ecologists at the Charles Darwin Foundation is to provide knowledge on the age, growth, movement, reproduction, and mortality of these species for the conservation of Galapagos. So we have a lot of fisheries um, fin fishes. About 60 species mostly are groupers and snappers. Um, three lobster species, they're quite delicious. Um, um, we have three, at least three mollusks, so chitons, um, octopus, um, I hope the octopus outside didn't hear me, but um, uh, gastropods, so large snails, and of course the very um, well-known cucumber fishery, which has been closed for several years and is probably not going to open anytime soon. And what we're doing right now is um, we're looking at the life history of brujo, so this is a scorpion fish, um, very similar to your rockfish. It's very, it lives in deep waters, about 200 meters, um, and we know very little about their life history. We're looking at the effect of El Nino on the fisheries, the benefits of these no-take areas um, for uh, lobsters, and the role of mangroves um, for groupers and snappers. So this is bacalao, which actually means cod, um, even though it's not a cod, um, as you would know, and as, uh, or is it related to the Atlantic cod? Um, but some of the first settlers were Norwegian fishermen. And when they got there, they named them Bacalao. We're not sure why, but they did. And so we now call them Bacalao. And they are, they are really important for a traditional meal called Fanesca, which is served during Lent, uh, which is a Catholic um, uh, uh, celebration that occurs right around this time. So they're, they get fished very heavily during this period of time. And this yellowtail snapper, which is the one that I was mentioning, it's like playing Where's Waldo? That's the guy that we were trying to study. And something that I picked up here is otoliths and otolith analysis. And if you go to Ed3032, Dr. Jessica Miller um, has a very nice stand where you can learn a lot more about the otoliths. But basically, they're ear bones that, occur, that um, are present in bony fish. And so here's an x-ray of a flatfish, and right there is the otolith. They help in the balance and orientation of fish, and there's three pairs. What's really cool about them, um, well, there are many things that are cool, but a few things that are cool is that they're analogous to trees and tree rings. And this is the otolith of a Peruvian hake, which occurs off of Peru and Ecuador. Um, and they're analogous in the sense that they have rings. They can be daily, annually, and there are other types of rings as well, but those are the main ones that we use. And so, in some cases, if you're very lucky, like in this Peruvian hake, you can actually count them straight out. So one, two, three, four. This is the four-year-old. We wish all the animals were like this. That doesn't usually happen. This is very lucky. Um, so what we often have to do is use equipment such as this um, diamond saw, which is literally what it sounds. It was designed to saw diamonds, and we now get to use them to cut them in half and to polish them so we can then read the otoliths and get information from them. So I've talked a good amount of what I do at, at the foundation, but why am I telling you this? Well, a lot of what I've put in um, use at the foundation, I learned here. Um, as, you, as Cindy mentioned, I was a student here at Hatfield, and I was an OSU student. And a lot of the benefits that we get by being students here at Hatfield is, one, the academic opportunities. And it doesn't hurt that we're the second best fisheries program in the country. Watch your back, UW, we're coming for you. Um, which means that we have an amazing marine lab where many different uh, professors, and that means we have amazing professors, researchers, and mentors, and of course, just great staff, people, and a community that's always supportive. We also are on the coast, which means we have a diversity of habitats. We have sandy beaches, we have estuaries, um, we have the ocean, of course, very close by, and we have the valley next door. And that allows us to thrive and to go wherever our creativity takes us. In my case, I study sandy beach surf zones, which basically meant that we dragged different types of nets through the surf zone, which was really fun. It was very cold water, as you already know. Um, but basically, we were looking to collect juvenile salmon and their prey. It also allowed us to do some pretty funny, wacky things. For example, I was interested in um, the, the energy of the prey that the juvenile salmon were eating. So this is a very large canister 
full with liquid nitrogen. Um, and so I basically filled it up, loaded it on one of our trucks. I'm not sure if I was supposed to do that, but I did it anyways. And then we just drove around to our field sites and collected the prey and then put them in there to preserve them so that I could then take them back and use a bomb calorimeter, which is a lot more dangerous than it really sounds, than it, than it really is. No, excuse me, other way around. <laughs> it sounds more dangerous than it really is. Um, and I was able to uh, study the energy of that prey and then compare it to other habitats, for example, the asteroid, which are a no nursery for them. Again, that, the, the different opportunities allowed us to um, borrow equipment, for example, this very fancy theodolite, which allows us to map sandy beaches. So basically, you would look through the lens and then point at this marker that allowed us, us to measure distance and, and difference in, in height and develop these really cool three-dimensional maps. So this is the shoreline, so this is where we walk. And if you go this way, you go into the water. And what we found was that there were these big dips in the, um, in the, in the, the topography. So basically, there were these pools or, or potholes. Basically, you were walking in, and all of a sudden, you fell into a big, into a big pot. Um, and this was caused because of sand movement. So in the winter, your really big waves move the sand offshore, in the summer, smaller waves move the sand onshore. And so it doesn't do it in a very completely homogeneous way, and it produces these areas where there's less sand. And it turns out juvenile salmon like to be right here. They're still protected from the surf, from the birds on top that are trying to eat them. Um, and they're, but because they're a little deeper, the water's a little calmer, and there, there might be some nice, tasty food to eat. We also did, again, we did some pretty crazy things. Um, we glued things onto the jetties, so we used different types of sensors to measure temperature. Um, fish are cold-blooded animals, and so temperature is extremely influential in their behavior and in their physiology and, more, and growth. And so what um, Lori here is doing is that she made a space in the rock to glue one of these sensors. Sometimes you can't glue them, so I learned to uh, mix cement here at the maintenance folks taught me how to mix cement, and so we made big um, weights that we could then put in the water. So we basically just tied a line, and that's the little sensor. It's a hobo data logger, it's called. They're 40 bucks a piece. So we just put them out there and measured temperature throughout the summer so that we can get an idea of what the temperature that these little fish were uh, um, uh, experiencing while they are out there. And then we walked the very heavy thing out in the water, and. Every now and again, we would come and with uh, some scissors, swim out, collect, and uh, take off the data. So to give you a very quick snapshot of what we learned, what we found was that juvenile salmon come down the stream, most of them to the estuary, but that certain number of these little fish were moving out into the surf zone, um, where they were feeding on very similar prey as they are in the estuary, and growing at very similar rates. In the surf zone, though, this movement of sand influences their presence. So beaches in which the sand and these potholes are, are formed are more likely to have the juvenile salmon. And the uh, presence of rocky headlands, such as Hecata head, for example, or, or Hasita head, for, for, um, depending on who you're talking to, might determine how far along the coastline they'll move. Uh, uh, headlands move farther into the, so into deeper waters, and to get around them, the juvenile salmon would have to go into deeper waters, which might mean you might encounter a big fish that might eat you. So you might not want to do that. So, and our temperature experiments, what allowed us to um, get an idea is what might happen in the near future. So, again, we have, we might have similar prey. But the higher temperature might require those little juvenile salmon to eat more, because higher temperature means you need more energy. Um, and that might mean that some of these little juvenile salmon might not be able to grow fast enough and die. And as you might find out in, our, um, in some of our booths, juvenile mortality is very important, because the, if a small, number of, uh, a small percentage of them die, that might mean lower numbers of adults returning to spawn or entering the fishery. So something else that I was very uh, thankful for was the opportunity of teaching and mentoring. We had several um, interns and fellows. So Lori was a COSI intern. 
Um, so she was a community college student who um, wanted to obtain more experience as a researcher. So she came to us. Um, we also had crews from, for two years, we had crews from the Community Services Consortium Youth Work Group. Um, and that, was, that meant that it was a group of uh, mostly high school age students um, that would, were looking for experience, for work experience during the summer. So what we did was we hired an OSU student who was um, uh, Katie Stover, and she basically mentored a certain number of students with the help of a scientist, which in this case was me. Um, and they helped immensely in the field, and I think they had a pretty good time from the, their faces. Um, and we also had some, well, I, we had a tradition that if we caught salmon, you had to kiss the salmon, and so that's what this picture is about. But um, so this is Brian and Lear, who were um, two OSU fisheries students, uh, undergraduates. And um, we have Nicole, who was in a research experience for undergraduate uh, fellow from Walla Walla. I believe. And um, Brian here um, um, was also was a local um, student who was also interested in experience. Um, they learned, I've made them do some things that they weren't supposed to do apparently, so like swimming in dangerous currents, um, which they seemed to enjoy. They thought that was hilarious. And I'm pretty sure we helped them sleep better at night. Um, it was pretty hard work, and we left at 3 in the morning often to the work site. They were high school students, so they had to go home every night, of course. And so we did a lot of driving, and um, they caught up on some of that sleep on the way back. The other thing um, which I'm very thankful for was the opportunity to um, have experience in outreach. Um, I was a visitor center aquarist. So back then, the, vi the visitor center that you see around us had two aquarists. One was an OSU student, and the other one was an Oregon Community College, um, Oregon Coast Community College um, aquarium science student. And it was a great opportunity for us to, well, get involved in outreach. Right? That's what we do. We um, help educate um, all our visitors. And so these are, were that uh, community services um, work group. And they would spend a lot of their time here since I was also here. Um, and so I had a great uh, experience here as, a, as an aquarist, working with not just people like them, but our volunteers and several people went from the Oregon Sea Grant program who um, helped manage that. And the great thing about this program and this visitor center is that OSU has a teaching science and math program, which means extra students who are basically um, studying how to best uh, reach different audiences. And this happens to be a great place for that. Um, one of the activities that we often did and I think still do is the feeding of the octopus. So this is Harrison Baker, who was um, the OCCC um, part of, of, of our partnership. So he was then feeding the octopus in that particular moment. And this was obviously a great experience for the community college students who then got some very, very good hands-on experience. So this is um, uh, Paul and one of the interns trying to get the um, large octopus, the large Paci the, the Pacific, o one, of the, one of our Pacific octopuses out of the tank. And if you've ever had to wrestle one, I don't know why you would but they're really difficult to move when they don't want to move. Um, but it was, well, and it was quite a wet experience too, as you can see. So the other part is great training opportunities. The Oregon Research Hatchery Center is just south of here, and they have some pretty amazing um, uh, 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 institution and, and locations. They have these raceways for the salmon. They have these um, artificial streams that they can modify to, to run different experiments and to train students into how to sample. Um, and they have this, uh, they have a river going back, the Alsi River, I believe, and they have things like these salmon uh, small traps to then study the life history of the salmon that occurs there. Um, the other thing is that we have great collaborative opportunities. We have several um, federal and local institutions here, um, NOAA, EPA, ODFNW, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, et cetera, et cetera. And that get, gets us students a great opportunity to have other opportunities, like um, getting onto uh, field vessels. So this is the Frosty, which is actually a fishing uh, vessel, but is, hired, is contracted by NOAA to run their juvenile salmon 
um, monitoring program throughout the, the coast. And so basically you get to go throughout the whole from northern Washington south to, to mid-Oregon uh, collecting all these awesome fish like this very large mola mola. It was about three to four feet long as you can see. And have this great opportunity to hang out and talk to different scientists while they're in the field. So pick their brain and have this amazing opportunity. And no work is got to work hard and play hard. So they're great leisure opportunities. So the um, grad students, we put together a soccer uh, group. And you can see a lot of undergrad, uh, excuse me, graduate students, but also staff, faculty, research um, that came out to play. We also uh, ex had some good exchanges with the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology. So this was the exchange uh, between them and us. We had some fun games and usually presented our research to each other and had some good ways to collaborate. And we in organized the Olympics. So basically it meant like uh, sack races and um, different opportunities to get wet and muddy um, and declare a winner, <laughs> which basically everybody won, which is a great time. So all these amazing opportunities allowed me to go where I have, be I have gone. And the question is, so where are we going from here at the foundation? So um, this is a map of the archipelago. And I apologize if the islands are not that clear. Here's Isabella, for example. But what you see is this is the zoning of the whole archipelago. In red are no-take areas. Um, and in yellow, you see areas where uh, tourism is allowed. The rest is actually open to fishing. What's interesting about this, A, is that a lot of it is open to fishing, but B, it doesn't protect these open water areas where sea mounts occur. So basically, there are large mountains that don't pop out of the um, water, so you don't see them above the water. And that's an issue because we have a large and very uh, mostly undescribed communities that ex in, ex um, inhabit these um, mounts. And so thanks to some work from us and from National Geographic, this, oh, this is the um, new zoning that will come into place at the end of this year. So the first thing that jumps out is this large area over here. That's a national sanctuary. It's a shark sanctuary. The idea is to protect that huge biomass of sharks that occur there. And now you can see very large polygons, what we call, that go out into this open water, looking to protect those sea mounts and whatever uh, sea life we don't know, but that we should probably be uh, preserving for our, our next generation. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming, our collaborators and donors. But above all, I want to thank just everyone at Hatfield for the amazing time that I had here. Um, and I hope I can answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's a very good question. So um, depending on the species, they're used locally or um, they are exported both to the mainland and to the US. Um, so besides those benthic species, we also catch a lot of tuna and wahoo. Most of that is exported. Um, but for example, bacalao is brought to the mainland for that meal that I mentioned, fanesca. Um, the the uh, snapper is often filleted and sold to the cruise ships. Um, the, the meat tends to be a little less fishy, and so it's very attractive to our visitors. So it, that, uh, lobster is a combination of both. A lot of people like to eat it, but um, if you buy it, for example, if you're visiting, you can actually freeze it, and then they'll give you a little piece of paper so that you can take it home with you. So it's, yeah, it's a combination of all. 
No one is eating them at the, pre at the present because we closed that fishery a few years back, but most of that was going to the Asian market. Um, sure. So they're um, so a they're a donor and b they're a partner in um, a lot of the outreach uh, that we do. So they have a group called Christine Feast. It's a foundation within the National Geographic um, that, for example, pays salaries for some of the researchers and uh, has grants, uh, research grants for us. Um, so they're 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 quite a strong partner for us. Yeah. Um, it could be. Um, the fishery has been, it opened a few years back, but they realized that was a mistake. But basically it's been closed for the, this since 2010 or so. And the population, so the Galapagos National Park, and I should mention that all of our projects are, um, are collaborative with the National Park. And they conduct a survey every year of lobster and cucumber. And they don't see the numbers popping up. Um, every now and again, El Nino year comes by, and two or three years, the numbers go up, but they don't go far up enough. So we have a certain number of indexes um, that we have developed, and if they basically surpass those indexes, kind of like NOAA's red light, green light um, index, if they surpass those indexes, then we open the fishery. If they don't, we, we keep it closed. And it doesn't look like it's going to get to that point anytime soon. Uh, the hope is, is that... Um, in the long run, we could sustainably manage that fishery, but I understand that certain countries are trying to grow the, the cucumbers in aquaculture as well, and that would probably take away that, um, that market for us. That's a very good question. So, Initially, most of the people that came over were fishermen or fishers. Um, these days, most of the economy is driven by tourism. Um, and, but there is, because there's a, a permanent population of about 25,000 people, there is some agriculture. And the Ministry of Agriculture and Environment are encouraging that agriculture because it means relying less on the mainland. Bringing potatoes, for example, we can't clean every single potato. That might mean another invasive species coming over in that sack of potatoes. So the idea is to eliminate some of that dependence of the mainland. And that one way is agriculture. And um, we've got cattle as well. Um, it's a very good question. Uh, uh, so. Because of all of our funding is through grants and donations, all of our research positions are soft money, which means that when there is money, you, you have a contract. When there isn't, it ends. Um, at present, my position is secured for a few more years. And, um, but after that, basically, we're constantly writing grants and looking for more donors to, uh, to make sure that we can in, ex extend our stay. But um, so even though I'm Ecuadorian, I'm not actually a legal, uh, no, sorry. I'm not a permanent resident of Galapagos, so I'm a temporary resident. So um, it's very difficult to become permanent um, in the Galapagos. And so if my if my uh, contract were to end, my uh, residency ends too, and so I have to go back to the mainland. The idea was to um, stop too many people from staying on the island and um, reducing that um, footprint from us. 